It's a pretty well-known fact amongst family that the Hollowells are pretty terrible fishermen. We have a pretty pathetic track record of various fishing trips. One of ours was to Bass Lake a whole week in northern Wisconsin, and to begin the week, my brother Matt decided he was going to buy a, a bait that was going to really bring all the fish in. And so using a little bit bigger pole than a Snoopy pole, he purchased about an 8 inch black and white plastic fish with 3 inch hooks on the bottom of it. And he cast that thing into the lake all week long and caught nothing the entire time. We eventually learned that that was bait used to catch walleye and some of the largest freshwater fish in all of the world. Um, it was a noble attempt, but came up with nothing. The pride and joy, though, of the Hollowell fishing uh, accomplishments was achieved by none other than your priest, Father John Hollowell. This moment is captured in our, at our home from a time we were down at Gulf Shores, Alabama, and we had a whole day on a, on a saltwater lake um, and we were going fishing, and all, all five boys and my dad were fishing, maybe some of my sisters. We probably had at least seven poles in the water throughout the day. And of course, like most expeditions, had caught nothing. About two or three hours in, eventually John's pole goes tight, and he starts reeling it in. And we're all getting pumped up. Oh, finally, we've got a fish, and it's coming in, and it's coming in. And what comes out but a massive stingray. And we were like, that's awesome. <laughs> but, but that's not really a fish. But we didn't care. So John pull, Father Hollow pulls out the stingray. And we have on our wall a picture of him with the proud one fish that we've caught that's hardly a fish. Of him holding this stingray and my little sister looking up in awe at what he had caught. Um, we're just not really good fishermen. But that one fish that we caught is our beloved fish, and it's still every day kind of our pride and joy on our family wall at home. Today we read a little bit about Christ, who it's helpful to remind ourselves of his ability to fish. And he was the son of God and a powerful man, and yet he also was a pretty pathetic fisherman. He certainly got a lot of people to follow him. Uh, we read, we're at the end of chapter 6 in John, and those of you who've been around for the last five weeks have heard this story develop. And five weeks ago, it began with the multiplication of the loaves and fish. And Christ took five loaves and two fish and fed 5,000 people. And the people were thrilled. They said, who is this man? And scripture says they wanted to take him off and make him king. But Christ wouldn't let him. He went off on his own. The crowd He's all, Christ is alone. They go and follow him. They keep following him like, oh my gosh, we got to get more from this guy. I mean, could you imagine? He did this with five loaves and two fish. Imagine what he can do with a whole cornfield and a whole pond of fish. This guy's our man. He's going to feed us for life. So they follow him. And in following him, he teaches them. He teaches them, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you will not have life within you. They kind of scratch their heads and like, you want us to eat your flesh? He says, those who eat my flesh and drink my blood will have eternal life. And we hear the disciples say, this saying is hard. Who can accept it? Christ doesn't take back his words. He continues to reaffirm them and says, does this shock you? But this is the truth. And it says this beautiful line in scripture. As a result of this, many of his disciples returned to their former way of life and no longer accompanied him. We have a mass exodus of people who once were following him. The fish were gathering around. They were gathering around and departed and left and said, we've had enough of this guy. This isn't the only time this happens in scripture. We remember him going into Jerusalem and everybody's throwing palm branches and olive branches out. We love this guy. Let's sing him songs. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. And 48 hours later, this man is dead on a cross with only his mother and a few disciples around him. He knew how to get the fish to gather around him, but very few took the bait. In our own world today, we are involved in the new evangelization. And we are tasked with going out and proclaiming Christ again to this world that has forgotten him. 
and has often abandoned his ways. And at times we can think, gosh, we just need to get more people here. We need to get more people in. And that's certainly true. But we need to remember that if we're truly proclaiming Christ, we should expect rejection. We should expect abandonment. Not by everyone, but by many, as Christ experienced today. And even the ones who follow him, they're not that impressive. You know, Peter says, he says to the twelve, do you guys want to leave too? And Peter says, well, where else can we go? You know, that's hardly a vote of confidence. It's kind of like saying, well, you're the only one we got, so I guess we'll hang around with you. That's kind of like pulling out a stingray, you know, kind of let Christ down a little bit. But Christ is thrilled. He's thrilled at his disciples that have truly followed him, not just for bread, but also followed him when the teachings became hard. And not only when the teachings became hard, but when following him and living like him became hard. It's a fact that 11 of the 12 apostles that we read about today, 11 of the 12 of them were martyred. You know, Peter says, you have the words of eternal life. And they go and get killed by Roman governments and by Jewish persecutors. That's hardly a thrilling experience. Maybe they too felt a bit let down. Following Christ doesn't always lead to life here in this world. It actually often leads to death. But we know, is Christ letting us down? Well, no, Peter's words are true because... What's going to happen to all of us here? We too are all going to be let down by this world. We too are all going to die one day. There's a lot of different ways you could have spent your Saturday afternoon. You could have fixed up your yard a little bit more. You could have watched reviews of how Notre Dame is finally going to win a national championship this year and not do it again. You could have done many other things and visited family and friends. But anything else you could have done today eventually is going to fade away. Your yard is going to get dirty a hundred years from now. It's going to be a forgotten piece of land. I love the picture of my brother's photo in our house, but one day our house will not be there. This whole world is passing. And as we read in the opening prayer, it said, Lord, help us to remember that this world is passing and instead focused on things that bring eternal life. What brings eternal life is Christ's. And that's who we consume today in this Eucharist. We're not getting a raw deal. We're getting the greatest promise we could ever get, which is not that we will be prevented from an earthly death, but that we will rise to eternal life with Christ. The way we do that is consuming his flesh and blood. This wasn't just something we decided to make up. It's something Christ himself taught. He said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you will not have life within you. The story of Adam and Eve goes, Adam was alone. He was by himself. And God says, it's not good for man to be alone. So he takes, puts Adam to sleep and takes a rib from his side. And from that rib, he fashions Eve. And when Adam sees her, he says, behold, this is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. So too, at the end of our lives, when we die, we will all be in a tomb. But we who have eaten the body and blood of Christ have a special privilege because Christ will be able to take our bodies to the Heavenly Father and say, Behold, this is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Just you, as you, Father, have raised me to eternal life, so too I ask you, raise these bones that are my body and bring it to everlasting life. And that, my friends, is... A promise worth dying for. That's a promise worth living for. It's a promise worth suffering for. The teachings may get hard. The life may get hard. But Christ isn't letting us down. He is providing us eternal life. If only we are willing to follow him to the very end.